Why have so many products disappeared from store shelves? Why has restaurant food become so expensive? It feels dangerous to walk the streets of the city, and then, one day, you see streams of water. Torrential rains flood the place. People are panicking and don't understand what's happening. You move to another country, but droughts and fires begin there. All this makes no sense, and problems appear chaotically one after another. But, in fact, all these events are closely connected to one another. The cause of many economic issues and natural disasters is warm water and weak winds. Take a look around. Sunny weather, rain, snow, drought, frost, and high humidity are all common weather phenomena that we don't think about too much. But if you understand their causes, you'll see that all the processes occurring in nature are closely interrelated. A drought in one region causes rain in another. Cold currents at the equator can change the economy of many countries. Let's figure out how it works using the example of a climatic phenomenon called El Nino. But first, let's find out about such a thing as upwelling, thanks to which millions of sea creatures and people get food. Imagine our planet and draw a line along its middle. This is the equator. The trade winds blow on both sides of it. They constantly go towards the equator from the northeast in the northern hemisphere or the southeast in the southern hemisphere. Two lines of these winds encircle Earth, moving from a high-pressure zone to a low-pressure area. When these trade winds travel west along the equator, they move warm water from South America to Asia. When this happens, cold water takes the place of warm water in South America. It rises from the ocean's depths and brings many nutrients, such as nitrates and phosphates. Tiny marine organisms such as phytoplankton use these elements for photosynthesis and, thus, produce oxygen. Without these phosphates and nitrates, phytoplankton won't survive. And the planet needs them not only for oxygen, but also to support the life of larger creatures. For example, mollusks feed on phytoplankton. Many little fish feed on mollusks. And then, large marine inhabitants prey on these fish. This food chain works thanks to phytoplankton. And these little creatures exist thanks to cold water filled with useful substances. So, this is the upwelling. When fish are full, they multiply. If fish reproduce, then the economies of Peru, Ecuador, and Chile work just fine. The fact is that fishing is essential for these countries because they sell anchovies, tuna, mackerel, and other fish to many regions. The upwelling also has another vital mission. When the trade winds move warm water to the western Pacific Ocean, precipitation increases around the islands of Indonesia and New Guinea. So without the trade winds, these regions would experience a drought. All this balance of nature is disturbed when El Nino appears. This is a strange climatic phenomenon that weakens the trade winds and raises the temperature of the ocean. The winds don't carry away warm waters, so the cold water, rich in nitrates and phosphates, can't rise to the surface. The upwelling stops and the ocean's biodiversity gets slowly destroyed. Phytoplankton swims in warm water and waits for nutrients, but there's no food. The population of phytoplankton decreases and mollusks don't have food. Fish wander the ocean in search of food but finds almost nothing. In the ocean, starvation begins. Fishing vessels cast nets but catch a small number of fish. The next day, the same thing happens. Fishers can't sell their goods and the supply of seafood stops. People lose their jobs and prices for fish rise in stores. Fishers spend more money on fuel since they spend more time at sea. When they manage to catch something, they sell it several times more expensive. To get cod or tuna, restaurants have to pay large sums. Prices continue to rise and no one knows when it will end. But this is just the beginning. In those parts of the Pacific Ocean where heat should appear, the water driven by the trade winds remains cold. Fish living there can't tolerate such temperatures, which means some types of tuna won't survive because of the cold. El Nino can last for months or even years. During this time, a significant part of marine life gets reduced, and people living close to the equator may face a severe crisis. 
The warm water that didn't leave South America because of El Nino creates a large amount of precipitation. Torrential rains hit Ecuador and northern Peru, which causes floods in coastal areas. Streets are flooded and houses are collapsing. Rescuers evacuate people from buildings and take them to safe places. Destroyed infrastructure damages the economy. Then, water floods fields with crops and all the roads. The transport system stops working. Humid air, unsanitary conditions, and chaos contribute to the development of harmful bacteria and microbes. This causes health problems in people. Hospitals are filled with patients, and the healthcare system can't handle it. The situation is getting out of hand. This precipitation that fell over South America was supposed to come to Indonesia and Australia. So now, a drought begins in those regions. Water reservoirs, lakes, and ponds are drying up. The width of the rivers is decreasing. Farmers can't irrigate crops. All this also provokes an increase in prices for food, medical services, and other stuff. Local forests are deprived of moisture and dry up. Then just one spark and fires break out. It's challenging to extinguish them because water reservoirs are empty. Fires are spreading throughout the region, burning forests. Ash fills the air. In some areas, it's hard and even dangerous to breathe. People leave their homes. Firefighters work around the clock to stop the catastrophe and volunteers rescue animals. The residents of these regions may need months or even years to rebuild cities and restore economies and biodiversity. The devastating consequences caused by El Nino don't end there. It changes the global atmospheric circulation, a large-scale movement of air that spreads warmth throughout the planet. Because of El Nino, the heat sources remain in the east and don't displace the cold weather at the high latitudes of North America. This leads to the coldest and longest winter in California, Washington, and other northern regions. All this is a massive tangle of connections between natural phenomena and anomalies. To unravel it and track what weather changes can lead to disasters, scientists monitor the situation in the equatorial part of the planet. It's impossible to stop these changes in nature since we don't have the technologies to manage the climate on such a scale. But we can learn in advance about natural catalysts and take measures to reduce the damage they will bring. For example, scientists use a large-scale network of special buoys scattered in 70 places in the South Pacific Ocean, from the Galapagos Islands to Australia. Sensors mounted on buoys record currents, wind speed, and direction, record humidity levels, and measure water and air temperatures. Every day, buoys transmit data to scientists and forecasters around the world. Then people connect this data with satellite images and predict the exact appearance of El Nino. With this information, we can simulate the development of the situation and apply measures to mitigate the damage. And scientists have also learned to predict El Nino with the help of trees. A science called dendrochronology studies tree rings. If you cut a tree trunk and look at it, you will see that it's divided into round rings. They are like layers lying on each other. One ring is thin and the other is thicker. These circles show the climatic changes that have taken place in the area where the trees have been growing. Thin rings appear during drought and thick ones are caused by increased humidity. They're like signs indicating which climate change will occur next. By knowing the location of the tree and studying the rings, Scientists can learn about the past El Nino and get information about future weather changes.